doesn't have much to do with the way data flows unimpeded. It's really about the market overall. So I think the whole relationship with APIs really kind of reflects on the overall market and where the market is right now and the role that uh, startups and venture capitalists play into it. We're going to talk a bit more about this tomorrow, but I just wanted to bring that up. So I posed this question on Twitter uh, when I was writing this story this week uh, that, that was published Monday. And I started thinking, well, you know, what is the API anyway? Is, is it just a dumb connector? You know, is it just that thing that, you know, that we, that we use just to connect things very simply? Well, I think that is somewhat true from actually from the feedback I got from people online. But also, I, but I thought this was in particular was very interesting. And, and Christian is the founder and CEO of Tidemark, pretty interesting company that's using um, in-memory technology to provide almost like infographic style um, information for internal use uh, you know, for uh, managing operations in, in many ways. And he talks about this idea of the implied contract. And then with the implied contract, meaning that, for instance, for, with a service like Google Maps, right, it's like, I want to go from point A to point B, but I want Google to tell me how to get there. So that is the implied contract that we're starting to see. And that is a very sophisticated process that requires lots of different data points to come together to make that, you know, that experience really something that we will use again and again, that we'll want to use again and again and again. So here's another example. I just uh, was looking at this today from Fancy Hands, and they have a new API. Anyone use Fancy Hands out here? All right. And, um, so they just launched an API, and what they're trying to do is like kind of like create this automated workforce in a way. And again, I think this really speaks to how man, machine, and APIs are really coming together and how this relationship is evolving. And, in, and what they do is you know, they have their API, and, it, and they push out the request to the, to the assistant, you know, to all their you know, people who are in their community, and you can see here how it all works. Well. So that allows people then to create any kind of ape, um, any service they want very, very quickly. So for instance, uh, this one was for a, uh, you know, a food delivery service that, that you could use building their API. Essentially crowdsourcing, right? It's like you don't have to build, you don't have to build this all yourself and then push it out there. You can just go through fancy hands and, and, and the people will do it for you. And so I think that's really, that's gonna, really I think that kind of, this kind of thing is going to very much deeply impact how our economy works. And we're starting to see other examples of this where services are providing things like, you know, where you go in and take a photo inside a Walmart and you're paid to do that. And then you're also paid maybe to like make sure that the shirts are just arranged just, just right. I think this is definitely part of that and see what we're going to start seeing playing out more often. So again, our API is just a connector, or are they an engine for context? And I, I think probably that they're both. But what we're having is like these, these APIs are like spreading like roads across this online landscape. And now we're just trying to figure out how they actually are gonna how they're gonna work together and what they're what we're gonna do with them over time. Because as we just heard, really APIs don't die at all. They just they just stay there. So the question then becomes, I think in many respects, about how are we automating this whole process and how is that gonna work? And you know, we're starting to see kind of examples, for instance, with Ken Lane and his API Commons um, effort. And that, that's the kind of thing I think we're gonna need to see more of. But I think the problem is, is that everyone has a different idea of what is, you know, of how, for how to build an API. And so in the short term, it seems very hard to do. And the other problem that we have is like essentially we're seeing with apps, and um, Michael earlier today was talking about this, about this whole silo effect. And I think that you start to really see this when you start to look at you know, pictures like this where you see there's so many there's so many different apps that people can have on their phones. And you know, they're easy to use and everything else. 
But they're really just kind of almost like an extension of the whole client-server world in a way. And we're, not, we're changing some things. It's a lot simpler to use, and there's a lot more flexibility and everything else. But this is by no means perfect. And it's a high-stakes game. Um, there was a story in TechCrunch this week about how Instagram stopped uh, another service by cutting off their, well, they, the, the Instagram cut off another service. They blocked Moby's access to the Instagram API. So this, to me, like, raises lots of interesting questions then about how we're going to move into this new world where the, our brains are connected, essentially, when we're having fights over APIs and and their you know and their you know and their usage. Increasingly, what I think this means is that we're going to start to really wonder um, about. Well, first of all, we're going to start to really we're going to start to be increasingly curious about our phys physical realities, and. What we're starting to see is the ability to put APIs on practically anything. So these lawn chairs could, could, could essentially have several APIs connected to them at some point. We're seeing cars that, are, that have several APIs connected to them. There's all these different kinds of examples. And when you have all these, you know, these different kinds of uses for, you know, for APIs, how do they interrelate? What is that relationship that they have? So really, the question is, I think in many respects, and we were talking about this with Michael again at lunch, is really the cloud uh, the best way? Is it really the best way for us to really think about how APIs do relate to each other? Because what do we want? Do we want, I mean, if, if for instance, if I'm standing up here in five years' time, and I may be wearing different devices. There might be, you know, there might be several devices on my body that are connecting to third-party services. But if those, if, if those things on my body are connecting to third-party services, so we're going from my, you know, from my body to the third-party service back to my body again. So it, there's, that, that's almost un, unsupportable in a way, you know, where you're going to have this world where Potentially, it could just take forever to do things. You know, if like if you have to rely on on, on always going to AWS or Google or, or whatever it might be. Now, the clients are becoming much more powerful than ever before, and so we're seeing this kind of interesting convergence of apps, devices, and cloud services. But if those clients are getting more powerful than ever before, shouldn't the just our bodies be what are connected? And you know, to itself, shouldn't the the, the apps that are on our body itself be able to connect? Should we have to go out to these cloud services all the time? I think that's a question that we're going to have to explore more often. So it gets again to this question is like, how do we manage our brains? And I've had this chat with a few people over the past few days when you think about, well, um, if we're still dealing with, for instance, with proprietary APIs, right? And you know, and we're having things attached to our brains, what are the implications of something like that? So is it possible that, for instance, and you know, I won't use a brain example, but like an example of any other object where you can uh, use an API, for instance, on, on um, well, you might have a table, for instance, that's like essentially kind of a data object, and it only integrates with certain apps because that's what the table, you know, that's what the table permits. Or is it possible even that parts of your brain might shut off at some point? I mean, it's kind of like far out, you know, thinking, but I think those kind of questions are out there and need to be uh, further explored. So the question then, I think really, as I, you know, in, in this, this context of man, machines, and APIs is, you know, first of all, you know, we've learned that the infrastructure can be very much automated. We're learning much more how, um, you know, apps, for instance, and how the APIs relate 
in the, you know, the context for how we use them every day, for instance, with Google Maps. And we're starting to, we're starting to just to explore how apps affect the individual. So for instance, we're starting to see much more examples of the quantified self. So when you put those things together, you start to again, I think, come back to this question about, about automation. And again, back to my conversation uh, with Audrey um, last night. And it gets down to this question about what is the human human, and that is actually the title of the book, and that's a picture from the, from the book. And the book is really about kind of how humans and machines compare using the Turing test. Um, and it's very interesting to kind of look at how, you know, how we do, you know, how you prove that you actually are a human. And that is getting, I think, a little bit more complicated to do when I think you can see it, for instance, on Twitter with like automated tweets that get generated. Sometimes it's hard to tell what is the machine and what is a human. And I think we're starting to experience that in all parts of our lives. But in the end, as I, you know, I was walking around the, you know, talking to people in the booths at AWS reInvent, I started thinking about, I started asking them, you know, what are the APIs that are really working, what are not, what is the what are issues you're, that you're having, and several of the people said that they have trouble with consuming third-party APIs. And they said it comes down to that they're not entirely certain, for instance, about the uptime of the API. And it's often hard to get in touch with the people about who, who, have, who have provided the API. And that's why I think Google and companies like Google are in such a great position because they actually have the processes for developing these API, APIs internally. And I had a conversation with them earlier in the week about this. And, you know, and I said, well, what is your thoughts? What are your approaches to APIs? And, and, and the uh, person I was talking to said, well, we, we have built our own internal processes for uh, building APIs. We have our own API infrastructure. And he said, we, you know, there's just one process for, for everything, for the whole life cycle of the API. And I'm starting to hear a little bit about that, for instance, like what things that Eventbrite says they're starting to do. And um, I think the API Spark is a good example of that, where to really be able to be, I think, be successful as a startup, increasingly it's going to be how you are managing those APIs. And I see it more and more often in the people who I interview and and uh, the stories that I write. It's because those APIs are, are increasingly your crown jewels. And if they're your crown jewels, then you've got to be make sure that they're working really well so people can actually use them in a way that, that they expect to use them. It sounds pretty basic, but it actually requires a lot of work internally to do. And so that gets me to this last question then about are we looking at a world of a Google-controlled brain or an AWS-controlled brain, right? Where the, really the ones who are really mastering this capability with APIs are the Googles of the world. And I think this, I think this image illustrates it perfectly. The glass is connected to the data center. Is that really the right way to do it, Mike? Do you think that's the right way to do it? We had a long conversation about this over lunch. And I'm not so, I'm not so sure. And I really look forward to talking with people over about it over the next few days, because I think it's one of the most pressing topics we face, because I think it strikes right at the heart of who we are as individuals. And if we really do want to automate so badly, then how are we going to do it so we still remain independent, creative thinkers, because that's who we want to be. We want to be independent, creative thinkers. That is why I work in this world. And I think it's a big reason why a lot of people do, because they see the really the capabilities of the innovation, 
and they see what can be done, but when it starts to impede into our lives, into the way our lives, into the way we live our lives every day, that's when I think you have to start questioning the real powers in the house, be it Google and the others who control so much of the infrastructure. Thank you. All oh, right, great, thank you. Um, so it's rather interesting what you said about um, the big car bill. Um, whereas it would have felt quite nice if that talked to other things on me. Are we talking about a world where the API should be exposed locally as well as via cloud infrastructure? So, I, you know, are we getting to the place where um, I've got Twitter on my phone, I lose internet connection, but I can still push a link into Pocket on my phone because they expose local APIs and talk locally? So then I can break away from Google and Amazon. I think that's a, an excellent break in thinking that I'm not seeing right now um, from, you know, from people who I talk to. Um, but I am starting to see some, there are some, for instance, some um, new, new generation database providers that are thinking of like how the database works, for instance, through a cloud service, but also on the client locally. So you could potentially have that capability to do that. Okay, so what I'm thinking of is something like schema.org, where I can mark up my HTML, like address in a certain way, or right. like the old recards. Maybe now there's a way in which I can um, address a payload in a standardized way in which things can uh, manipulate that locally, and I can cut out the middleman. There you go. Yeah, I think that's, that, I think that's an, a good example you know, of things and where they might possibly go. So essentially, kind of like we become our own data centers in a way, <laughs> or we become our own nodes. And I think that's actually... A discussion I'm hearing more of that's related to this is that, you know, there's this whole concept that everything is a node. Like, you know, this is a node, you know, my shoe's a node, everything is a node. And if you can start connecting those nodes, then you might be able to have a more pure uh, experience in that relationship with the APIs. Thanks. <laughs> 